Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. to me all these years later how people are still coming up and talking about that it has this lasting effect and impact its enduring power may come from the chords it strikes among all of us we're all human beings and we were all children once pop culture has taken ownership of this miniseries it scared the hell out of millions of people <laughs> Advertisers were very nervous. This was a children in jeopardy story. We were breaking new grounds because I don't remember before any kind of material like this that I saw on television. The only source of disappointment for me was the fact that we couldn't go as raw and as bold as they did in the in the book. One of the comments is, is typically, Tim Curry is the reason why I'm terrified of clowns. Steve's particular spin was to take something that's much loved and familiar and ratchet it up as far as it could possibly go. Wow. Tim could act to a manhole cover because he has that kind of charisma and presence. He brought more to the character than was written on the page. I saw it as a fantasy character. It was an illusion that it's presenting to these children. I wanted it to almost be like a living cartoon. And he said, if you want me to wear this scary makeup, then I think you have the wrong actor. And I thought, what? I'll kill you all. Our director came to me and he said, Jim, I'm losing it with these kids. If it were filmed now with that same group of kids, there would be a lot of them who had diagnoses, maybe ADHD, oppositional defiance. Some of them just would not shut up. <laughs> we got in a lot of trouble. We were kids, both on set and off. <laughs> we couldn't get the next like three or four takes. The adults, they were actually more noisy than the kids. No, I didn't have it. And I want to apologize right now. That's it. You have to do your job. Most TV movies disappear into oblivion. I think the fact that it is consistently played on cable has opened it to a much wider audience. You say it, and people say Tim Curry. Down here we all flow. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 449. Available now on the Screenbox streaming platform is Pennywise, the story of It, a documentary that takes a deep dive into the 1990 TV miniseries It and its impact on a generation of horror fans. Featuring exclusive behind-the-scenes footage and interviews with cast and crew who worked on the miniseries, Pennywise, the story of it, is a fascinating and engrossing delve into a seminal horror event. And joining me now on the podcast to talk about Pennywise, the story of it, are directors John Campopiano and Chris Griffiths. John and Chris, I thank you both so very much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so, John, I'm going to... Um, I asked you this question first because it's really interesting kind of like how this project kind of came together, almost kind of serendipitous in, in a sort of way. You were looking into doing Pennywise yourself. Um, you previously did um, a documentary on a Pet Cemetery, um, But then on the other side of the world, Christopher, yourself and your um, producing partner, Gary, you guys were also looking into doing it as well. And somehow you both kind of found out that you're both kind of interested in working on the same thing. So, John, how does it come that yourself and Chris and Gary kind of get together and say, you know what, we both have this idea, we both love this um, with this, um, this movie, this project, and Tim Curry's performance. How about we both kind of like yeah, get to working together on this? Well, it, it first started, I, I went to my my partner on the Pet Cemetery doc, Justin White, and I said, um, hey, man, I, what do you think about doing a doc on it? And he said, no, I, I'm not interested in doing any more documentaries. He uh, hmm. Pet Cemetery took us a long time to make. Uh, all self-funded and it was it was a process and at the time Justin had a four-year-old and an eight-year-old and he said you know I'd really my kids are getting older I'd really rather spend time with them 
than be in a hotel room with you in the middle of Maine. Uh, <laughs> so I said, fair enough. And, um, and figured, well, maybe I'll try to do it on my own kind of knowing there's no way I would be able to. And I think I posted a picture of a balloon on Facebook that Gary had seen. And at the same time I had sent Chris, maybe a tweet or an email. I don't remember what I said. Chris can probably tell you more, but um, expressing an interest in doing a documentary. And, and that's kind of how we came together. And, and I had gotten to know a guy named Bart Mixon, who's an amazing special effects makeup artist in, in Hollywood. And Chris and Gary had worked with him several times already um, on their Fright Night docs. And, and so um, Bart was kind of the, the go-between for us. Um, and that's my, that's my memory of it anyway. What about yourself, Chris? What do you remember about how kind of like these kind of like two different uh, worlds kind of like came together for this one project there? I feel so guilty. This is like cathartic now because I feel I have to tell this story all the time now and feel more guilty. But when John says he approached me on Facebook, I've got a bit of a bad habit of overlooking some messages that float into my inbox uh, at times. And I think John's was one of them. But I had that vague recollection of like, oh, that message I must get back to at some point. And I think I've mentioned it to Gary, but it was a bit out of the blue that John had approached me to uh, so say, hey, oh, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I see you guys are as well. Um, are you interested in doing a documentary on Stephen King's this? It's like, cool, I'll, I'll get back to that at some point. Um, and poor John then actually made the right choice by going to Gary, who's a lot more switched on when it comes to emails, hence him being the producer. But as John had said, we'd worked with um, Bart Mixon, whose credits are just beyond, to be honest, um, his resume. Uh, he's worked you know, on Nightmare on Elm Street films. He's worked on uh, Chainsaw Massacre films. You know, a lot of the, the big horror films of the 1980s. So we had covered him off with uh, our Fright Night Part 2 documentary. And the year prior to getting Pennywise off the ground, um, Robocop documentary, which he had worked on as well. And um, the thing with Bart Mixon is the guy is as much a fan of what he works on as we are of his work. Right. Um, and so all this time, and probably for the sakes of, you know, uh, John had said this before, like uh, continuity uh, and keeping a resume of his work, he possesses a wealth of materials uh, of his work. So he had told us, but given that, you know, Pennywise's uh, Tim Curry iteration is his baby, he is incredibly proud of it. He's got this wealth of behind the scenes videos that have never been seen, uh, photos as well to go with it. So that is a fundamental aspect. Uh, hopefully it shows to all our documentaries. It's like, okay, you've got photos never seen before. Okay, mm. you've got videos as well. And then that was pretty much it. Then John and Gary, I think, then kind of led the way in terms of getting things off the ground um, because I'm about as useful as a cat flap on a submarine when it comes to organization. <laughs> Just leave me to the leave me to the creative, and that's all I'm good for. So yeah, it was it was yeah, it was good. It was a good start, and yeah, that was where the journey began. You know, Chris, it's really interesting. The world of Stephen King has given us so many different, you know, books, series, movies. What is it about it, though, that for yourself and Gary and John, that really kind of resonated to such a degree that you were willing to give, you know, years of your life into kind of delving into the making of this series? Because we were talking off off record, um, off um, uh, off screen just before about how, you know, that that's the series had such a pivotal kind of like linchpin event in the lives of a lot of people myself included i remember being nine years old when it first came on tv here i'm not sure about the ages of youtube i'm sure maybe it's around the same age maybe you guys saw it at the same time is that what it comes down to a lot of times that it had kind of like such a, an influence as, as you as a young horror fan in the kind of still kind of dispute that's why you wanted to dive into it further I was quite a latecomer to it, actually. Um, I know a lot of the guys had seen it at such a young age. My earliest memories of it uh, was certainly seeing the photos and some, you know, maybe promotional materials on videos or TV adverts, and people always talking about it in school. So I came, I think it was towards the tail end of VHS, I finally watched the original it. Mm. Um, but in terms of going in for this project, it, it was an absolute no-brainer. I'd say, you know, if you think Stephen King, in terms of an instant iconic image of his work i think pennywise is if not the top very very close to the top um the you know the original tv miniseries itself is obviously incredibly iconic as well you know as you said it was it was an event of its time um, and in terms of our choice of making you know documentaries on these films you know the choices is a do we like it yes and b 
has anything, has there been any other sort of documentary on this before? And it was, a, I think, a massive thing that was missing, to be honest, um, for the legacy of the original miniseries was actually there's not been a legit definitive documentary on this film. I think the only thing that's existed up to this point has been the audio commentary that was featured on the DVD, which was great. But mm. with, with, I suppose, being visual storytellers, that's not enough for us. Um, so, yeah, that, that's for my two cents, mate. John, when it comes to these kind of deep dive documentaries, I'm just really curious about what is the nucleus of the documentary kind of t- kind of sprouted to like a, its its total whole? Is it is it the footage? Is it the interviews? What is it that's at the center of these documentaries that you think kind of like springs is a spring, kind of like the springboard for everything else to follow with it? What do you kind of approach first with this? I think for me, it's it's the the footage and the photos, the archive. I mean, my, my day job, I'm an archivist. That's what I went to grad school for. I've always been sort of a digger. My parents, you know, were steeped in family genealogy as a kid. So like, I've always sort of had a tendency to look backwards at things and be fascinated by uncovering something that maybe nobody has seen before, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that kind of keeps me up at night when I'm working on a project, you know, and it's to a point where it's like, well, maybe there's more it photos out there. And it gets to a point where it's Chris or Gary have to be like, we're not editing anymore. The film is out. You have to stop. <laughs> you have to stop looking for stuff. Um, that that gets me going. You know that that fuels me. And um, you know, I think Chris has said in the past that you know when we do these documentaries, our goal is to sort of have this be the definitive say on whatever the doc, whatever the film is. You know, um, I felt that way about Pet Cemetery. I was like, you know, we're going to make sure that there's nothing left. There's no meat on the bone for anybody else to come and make another documentary about Pet Cemetery. Um, and the same was the case for it. I think for me growing up and seeing the, the miniseries as a kid and being really terrified by it, uh, same with Pet Cemetery. actually, you know, the, the scenes of Zelda were, are, are visceral. I can remember, I, I remember exactly the bunk bed I was on at my friend's house watching that on VHS for the first time um, yeah. and being terrified and being grateful I was on the top bunk because I could hide under the covers and not actually look at the TV without my friends noticing and giving me shit for it. <laughs> so in some ways it's therapy. It's, it's kind of like revisiting these old, this old trauma from seeing these movies as a kid. And unpacking them as an adult and, and finding out what went into them. And, and um, so it is, it's cathartic and it's, it's fun. It's interesting, but I think the heart for me is, is the archive and, and finding stuff that maybe has been sitting in someone's attic or basement for 30 years that nobody has seen before and bringing it to life and seeing people get excited about it. Like, Holy shit. Like I've never seen that before. And, and I, you know, that, that keeps me moving, you know, Chris, coupled with the the archive footage in, in, in the documentary is, of course, the interviews. And essential to the story of it is talking to Tim Curry, the man behind Pennywise. It's really interesting how trying to get him on screen, you know, Tim Curry these days, you know, unfortunately back up because like 2012 he had a stroke. So um, he tends to keep more to himself now, does more voice work, more than anything else, doesn't really go to conventions, very private person. And it was a long game for you. You know, it took around a year or so for you guys to get him uh, on screen or to agree to do so. But this is a long game that you have had experience with. I think Peter um, Peter Willow with uh, Robocop um, doc took like six years. Um, on, on, on the other end of the spectrum, you had Clive Barker. You couldn't get for the Leviathan. So you kind of had the ups and the downs of this. Having that experience behind you, when it comes to that kind of long game play of trying to get Tim Curry on in, in this movie, does, that having, does having that experience, the highs and lows, make it easier, make it harder, um, give you, you know, the right kind of tools, the right kind of uh, approach to how to approach someone like a Tim Curry um, to try to get him on board a documentary like this? Um, I'll, I'll say in the first instance, it was uh, thanks to John and Gary's combined efforts that we got Tim. I think actually, I suppose... Given our experiences, and perfectly what well, you're very well educated, you know your stuff. So that's a real up all the other examples. Um, by comparison to some of those others you've mentioned, Tim Curry felt, at least from my angle, a bit of a breeze to get. Mm. I know. I think he was relatively early, actually, in our sort of pre-production phase, because it the kind of it all snowballed after him. John can definitely um, quantify that as a uh, truth. I think. Um, mm. So, as you said, I mean. There's always that fundamental person you need to get, the, the face of a particular IP. Um, and as I said, we, we've had some highs and lows, uh, or certainly long games in terms of achieving some of them, uh, some others easier than uh, the other ones. Um, but with Tim Curry, 
it was John. You might want to back me up on this one, mate, because you're more educated. But I mean, how long was it? It was a few months, was it, before we got him? I'm going to let John tell the story if that's all right, Matthew. Just that's because okay. it'll be a lot more succinct. No, it, it might have been six months. I don't really remember, but I, I know that it, it, we took some time to sort of nurture the relationship with Tim's agent, who oversees all of his personal appearances and public appearances. So um, I think compared to Robo, the RoboCop documentary, it was reverse, right? Like we got sort of the top dog first. And I think Gary reminded me recently that I, I think we sort of even said that if we couldn't get Tim Curry, we may not have moved forward on doing a documentary at all. We really mm. felt like we had to have him. Um, whereas Peter Weller, they got him sort of late in the game. So they had done all the work ahead of time. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it was about six months or eight months of kind of nurturing that before we made the formal ask and, and, the right recommendations in his inner circle went up the flagpole and, and we got the green light, um, which was huge because then it opened the door for a lot of other things between funding and press coverage and other people saying yes to being interviewed. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon. The world's leading online store, Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. You know, John, it's really interesting when watching this documentary, um, especially when it comes to Tim Curry. The 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 fact that he came very close to actually walking away from the role because of the whole makeup um, problem that he had. So, for people who don't know, Tim Curry played um, the role of Darkness in Ridley Scott's Legend, and of course, he's just in this huge kind of like you know whole kind of like makeup shindy. But he found the, the found it to be just claustrophobic, just like untenable, didn't want to do it again. And of course him playing like a character like it, what the filmmakers want to do is put him through that plaster and everything again. He was like, fuck that, I'm not going to do it again and I'll walk away from the role. And that to me was like really kind of like, wow, you know, that's a, that's a guy really sticking to his guns there. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, the director, like made sure that, you know, it wasn't such a, a bad kind of go for him. But when you come across kind of like little tidbits like that in in the the it story, um, does that kind of like excite you as a fan as much as a filmmaker? Because I know when I was watching it myself, just the idea that there was a potential that Tim Curry could be walking away to what could probably outside a Rocky Horror Picture Show to be his most pivotal kind of performance of his career was kind of like something that's almost kind of uh, uh, shocking to me in a kind of like in a kind of like in a retro sense. Going back to the first times that I saw him, I can't imagine anyone else but him playing that role. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with you. And I, I think it's also interesting to think about had he not done Legend, would he have been more open to a heavier makeup? You know, mm. and how would that have influenced the character? And would that have influenced how people thought about the miniseries? I mean, I think for all of the good things that the new It films have done, I think one of the things you hear often is that Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise is really more of a creature. He's, he's not a friendly looking clown that you would a little kid would go up to. Right out of the gate, he's more of a monster as opposed to Tim's version where more often than not, he's like just an innocent looking clown. So had he not done Legend and been more amenable to being covered in makeup and prosthetics, maybe Pennywise would have been different in the miniseries and may not have had the, the kind of impact. It's all hearsay. I have no idea, but it's interesting to think about for sure. It is. And I think documentaries like that can really kind of like flare up the imagination on in, with a lot of film fans, especially in film historians, to think about the what if scenarios. Um, you know, Chris, something that's really interesting about the documentary is that you guys don't only delve into kind of like the making of the film, but you also talk about the themes that that the it's kind of like brought about. And I think the biggest thing that people kind of associate with it is the whole kind of scary clown phenomenon. I mean, it essentially did for clown, clowns what Jaws did for sharks, you know, it's essentially kind of like in the same kind of wheelhouse there. Um, 
I didn't even think of myself because here in Australia, we don't get circuses like that much. It comes around once a while, but I'd hardly even seen the clown outside of like, you know, a statue of Ronald McDonald when I was a kid, right? <laughs> um, so they never, I never gave it any mind. But after watching that movie, it definitely left in, in, in an impression with me. Where even to this point, when I think about clowns, um, I, I think more of the, the negative than the positive. Um, the whole kind of like scary clown phenomenon, were you yourself a kind of like uh, scared of clowns even like when you by the time you had watched it um, and delving into the psychology of it, is there anything in the psychology of the scary aspect of clowns to kind of like give you pause for thought as to uh, why people were so scared of them uh, um, if, before and after it came out? I think um, I, we, we've said this actually a few times. Do you know what? One of our favourite sections of the documentary is that cholerophobia section uh, because it's one of the first times we've been able to kind of like transcend just the documentary on the making of a film. You know, it's actually, this goes into kind of worldwide uh, kind of aspects, if that even makes sense. Um, so in regards to clowns, for my own sakes, I don't think I've necessarily ever been that scared of them. I think I've kind of been aware of their use as horror icons mm. because of Pennywise. Um, I, uh, from my own experiences, I'm quite indifferent. I think the worst thing for me as a kid was when you were near one and nine times out of 10, their breath would absolutely stink. <laughs> you know, stink of cigarettes or something. Um, so I've never necessarily been scared of clowns. Uh, and I think it's a very fine balance when it comes to the medium of the film, when they are used as to what is, you know, actually making them scary. I, could, I think they can easily become hokey in the bit cliche uh, utilizing clowns. But upon like going through this section on cholerophobia, it has been really interesting to just sort of see the impact clowns have had and how it's just sort of um, transitioned from one thing to another over the course of what, probably the last hundred years, really. Mm. It's, it, it's evolved in light of like kind of, you know, um, situations like John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. Um, and of course, like, you know, re certainly the recent events we tackled uh, on all the clown sightings and everything. Um, but we've even got uh, you know people suffering cholerophobia and go to group therapy sessions, which is one of my favorite clips. Is the woman reacting to that clown? In a group that was session. that was incredible. She for people who are going to watch it, it's, it's incredible to see because she jumped right out of her chair, screaming and hollering like it just that's just like in, that's such an incredible kind of reaction to anything I've ever seen ever. I think it's just great, yeah. And I think it's just it's really great that we've been able to kind of go through that journey of clowns and their portrayal. I think it is fundamental, to be honest, to the story of it. It hopefully somewhat unpacks the reasoning for Stephen King choosing the entity of it to take the form of a clown. And it's, you know, why did he choose a clown? Well, kids are attracted to clowns. Adults yeah. don't see it like that. And we kind of del delve in a little bit further. We've got Bart Nixon and sorts uh, talking about the fact, you know, uh, the ideas that uh, I think they unused of like, you know, Pennywise would look different to the adults than he did to the kids. So there's like unu uh, unused makeup ideas um, there. So I think it's, it, it was just a real joy to kind of unpack that psychology of the clown. Um, but for my own, my own two cents, I'll just... I've just never really been scared of them, to be honest. I think they're actually cool because I'm a horror fan. John, I wanted to go back into kind of like the, the whole archive kind of footage part of, of this whole uh, project. So the, from what I understand, there's like up to 500 to 600 photos you kind of had to, like, kind of had to go through, um, or amounts of video, in, et cetera. You know, you were saying before that you kind of had to rein yourself back because you could you could just keep going and going and going because you know it's a passion of yours. When do you realize that you know you have enough when it comes to a project like this? And you kind of go, okay, let's just stop there and use what we got. Um, because I imagine, you know, even while filming, maybe even like during an edit, like some stuff would have been propping up and you're like, God damn it, why didn't this get handed to me three months ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of stop when the editor tells me to stop. I mean, you know, I, I feel like you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what's out there until you find it. And um, so I'm, I'm always eager to um, keep digging um, right up until we, I can't and the film is done, you know, or, or it's locked and, and we literally can't move anything around. Um, and I, I love like getting directions from editors, right? So Chris and I and Gary are working on another project, finishing a project right now on Robert England's life and career and, and you know, getting very specific targeted messages, like we need this or we're lacking this, you know, that's, 
that's another area where I feel like I do well and where I enjoy kind of the, the thrill of the hunt. Um, so yeah, I, I stop when the editor tells me stop or my wife comes in and, and takes my laptop away. Cause I have to go <laughs> better. You know, I'll just keep pushing it, man. Cause I do, I like, I, you know, I think about what else is still out there that we didn't uncover, you know, you'll never yeah. find it all. Um, but that not knowing is what fuels my, my interest, you know, Chris, I got the last question for you. It's really interesting over the last few years, maybe several years, how kind of like the deep dive documentary has become more popular, more prevalent. I have a theory of it myself in that as we kind of transition from physical media to streaming, what I loved about buying a Blu-ray or a DVD was that I wasn't only buying a movie. I was buying the documentaries that came with a movie. I was buying the commentary. And that's something that streaming can't really give to you. Like I can't watch, like, say, The Irishman on Netflix and not in in and access a one-hour documentary about how they made that. Do you think people, the reason why these kind of deep dives are so popular now, both with filmmakers and with film fans, is because that aspect is kind of missing from, from like the home entertainment experience people really want to know after watching the movie how they kind of made that movie and because of that the deep dive documentary kind of kind of fills that void that's just my theory anyway i think that's actually a really really good point to be honest and it's something this is the pennywise is the first time i think all parties involved uh, have kind of tackled the whole streaming thing and it's definitely something that's like you know crossed our minds a few times or been discussed that's for sure um because obviously initially for all of us all our initial documentaries were released on physical media. I mean, yeah. obviously, you've got your Friday the 13th and that on Elm Street, so much like you, mate. When when DVD first came about, I was just jumping out of my chair. I think I had my, I was sending my mum to uh, Woolworths every Monday going, <gasps> Terminator's out, special edition, has got these new documentaries. Yeah, yeah, everyone can be sure. Yeah. Chris, I'll buy it for you. Robocop's coming out the next week. All these films that we'd loved as kids were all coming out with deleted scenes. And yeah, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate, really, the way it's all going. I think, thank God for boutique labels now like imprint arrow criterion and everything like that still releasing physical media i think it'll always be there but in a much more niche way um and so what's interesting now i think with the deep dive documentaries they have always been there and they've always had to kind of operate on the fringes of um the film industry to a certain degree because like friday 13th for example and nightmare on elm streets alike they've all got their own studio sanctioned bonus features but then independent filmmakers like your Tommy Hudson um, come along and they will release these big four or five hour epic documentaries because I think, you know, some studios do a great job, but a lot of the times they do it as, okay, here's this medium. We have to add some extra features, you know, make it worth the purchase and everything. Yeah, that'll do two or three interviews. Whereas as fans, as, uh, you know, ravenous fans of this stuff, uh, there's, there's more. And, and, we are, and that's how we operate. We are fans of these films making things for fans. So we, we know what do we want. And it's not just one or two interviews. It's not just, oh, well, maybe a photo you've seen before. No, no, no. And, you know, thank God we got John with his archiving skills. It, we relish in seeing, like, all this material we've never seen before. And, you know, the idea for us, uh, for us is to deliver that to fans in the most engaging way possible. Going on to streaming, I think, it is interesting, though. Thank God for the likes of uh, both Shudder and... Um, Screenbox, of course. Yeah. I really shouldn't have hesitated to say Screenbox because they've been fantastic for us. So thank God they're embracing it now because maybe that's what it is. In the absence of, with the market slowly dying for physical media, the likelihood that you're going to be able to see new iterations of either the films you loved or even new films and getting those quintessential making ofs is becoming slim so it's nice to see to be honest that these streaming platforms are starting to embrace that now of course nothing <laughs> beats having a tangible physical thing in your hands you know like taking full ownership but um i think it's it's really good that they're they're embracing these long-form documentaries because there's a lot to be said that can't be uncovered in 10 minutes or something that's uploaded directly to youtube so uh we've obviously got the plans for physical release of this documentary down the line, which does have its own bonus features. I think we've uh, got amassed, amassed about an hour's worth of extra content. Mm -hmm. um, so even this as a big bonus feature or feature-length documentary has its bonus features. So I think it's, it's really good. I just hope, I just 
hope the whole physical media thing doesn't <laughs> die anytime soon. I'll be there fighting for it in the corner. Don't worry. Because my Barnes & Noble sales for uh, the Criterions. <laughs> well, for everyone out there listening, you can check out Pennywise, the story of it, at the Screenbox streaming platform, so that's screenbox.com. Um, really recommend you guys check this um, documentary out because I've watched a lot of deep dive documentaries. I've got to say, Pennywise, the story, it is one of the fa- my favourites I've seen so far. Uh, I love the production value. I love the interviews. I love how you guys built it in the archive footage, um, you know, having Tim Curry on board. And so much of the... Um, their cast and uh, cast especially that getting the majority of them, um, both the younger cast and the older um, cast as well. I think it's been it was a great feat. It's a really great coup from you guys to bring everyone together, um, and it's just such an interesting uh, documentary to watch. And um, it really brought back a lot of memories of when of my nine year old self when I first watched it when it came out. And um, you know, like I do have the DVD. Haven't put it on yet because I'm much like John, I'm a father, so it's kind of hard to like uh, get that time to, to, to work it in there. Um, but people do please check out Pennywise, the story of it exclusively right now at Screenbox um, and do check it out because it's a really, really great documentary. And John and Christopher, I thank you both very much for your time today. Can't wait to see your next projects. I know the, the Robocop one's out there. You've got the police, um, the police Academy one as well. You've got so many others. Um, can't wait to watch those as well. And uh, when it does, I want to talk to you guys again because it's been a, it's such a pleasure talking to you today. Sounds great, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.